and welcome to our live Facebook broadcast. We are going to give it a moment for Dr. Nancy Miller Ely to join us. But Dr. Nancy Miller Ely has been a trainer with Nutrametrics as long as I can remember, and I have been a Nutrametrics consultant. I just celebrated 12 years this spring. And um, she is the owner of Savvy Selections. Um, and she has helped so many people because Dr. Nancy Miller Ely is a product of the product. She has a really fabulous story herself, um, but her background is that she actually wrote white papers um, for the government on obesity. And so Dr. Nancy Miller Ely is a scientist at heart. And so when we think about the science behind our products and our differentiators with Nutrametrics, being the fact that we have the best products with ingredients that were in the clinical studies. But people are gonna question you. I get questioned myself all the time. I get questioned, um, Sarah, why are these products better than other products? I get questioned where people say um, that, you know, how do I know that these are going to work? How do I know that it's safe for my patients? So that's what Dr. Nancy Miller Ely is going to answer. Let's see, I'm going to bring Nancy. Oops. She's coming, she's coming. Here we go. Hi, Sarah. Dr. Hi. Nancy, hello. How are you this morning? We are doing good. Well, the fact that we both got on camera means that I'm doing great. It's going to be a good day. Yes, I agree. So I've already introduced you. The audience is warmed up. Oh, they are. Um, they are. They're all ready for you. And they're, they're thinking of their questions. But my biggest question is, what were the first questions, Dr. Nancy, that you asked of Nutrametrics? Like as a scientist, when you're thinking of products, what do you want to know when you say, do they work? What's the science behind it? What are you really asking? Well, for me, Sarah, it means that there's a focus on a scientifically based, clinically proven ingredient and or product. So, you know, a lot of times people would like to see that there's a double blind placebo controlled study or whatever. A very, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, That's careful. Fine. Oh, way double too big, blind, huh? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, well, what that means is uh, you know, there's different kinds of study designs. So when I look at a study, a scientific study, I want to know, for example, was it a meta-analysis? That's, that's the kind of study where they take research from a bunch of different studies and combine it together to draw a conclusion. Um, okay. It could be what we call a systematic review. That's where somebody goes through the literature and they, they look up everything related to an individual ingredient, say pycnogenol. That would be a great example. And there are literally thousands of publications related to pycnogenol. And then there's something that's called a double-blind placebo-controlled study. And that's where you have one set of the people who are receiving a particular treatment. We could use as example the, the new uh, trim tea with, where they're getting the well trim, which is one of the key ingredients. And then the other half of the people are what we call the control group or the placebo group. Now, when we have that, what, what happens, which is kind of cool, is that when it's double-blind, it means that the participants don't know if they're getting the, the, the study subject, you know, the study material, or if they're getting the placebo. But when it's double blind, it means the researchers don't know either. So that's really, in many people's mind, that's the best kind of study because you know we know there can be bias, right? We've, we've all heard of what we call the placebo effect. You know, you give a child um, a Tic Tac and tell them you know, that it's gonna make them tired and all of a sudden they wanna go to sleep. <laughs> but the Tic Tac yeah. probably wouldn't really have any influence on their ability to sleep. So um, many people feel that that kind of study is the best, but any study can be good if it's got the right components. And um, that means that the, 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 what they're trying to evaluate is clearly defined. So back to your original question, you asked me why I love Nutrametrics and what I see as the, one of the key ad advantages is that the company has really searched through the literature. We have a great science team and Dr. D and all, the, all of the folks over at corporate in Greensboro take time to look in the literature to see what's hot and what's not, to see what has good science supporting it. And that's why we create products that are amazing for everyone. And I also think that's why our health professionals can really get behind them because they don't have to have those concerns. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay, so I'm, I'm looking at the Trim T study. Right. 
Oh, this is okay. And so I was just going to ask you, how do I know what type of study? But it's right in the headline. <laughs> yeah. so I don't know if everyone knows, but I'll put in the link below. Someone made a great bit.ly link for the trim T study. So it's just B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash trim T study. So if you ever want to know how to find it, I don't know who made it, but um, I know Carrie Robert Smith, maybe she made it. She had posted it. So it's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash trim T study. So I'm looking and right here in the title, it says it's a double blind placebo controlled investigation. Yeah. So that's the actual publication and you're okay. right in the actual title at the end of it. It says that it's a double blind placebo controlled study. Is that where it's always going to say no, what type it's of study really not it is? The they, they, that was really what I would call, you know, very clear and overt. Typically you would have to read through it and just so people can appreciate it. Um, this is a seven page study with about a, I don't know, six point font. <laughs> so it's not an easy read. Okay. We're not, it's not reader's digest. <laughs> and the one yeah. thing that I would say to our listeners is that, you know, it's great to have the study if you know how to read the study, but I wouldn't hand out that study to just everybody because somebody that doesn't understand it might pick out one particular aspect of it as opposed to looking at the whole thing. So the things that I look at when I analyze a study, um, First, I'm going to look to see what is the focus of the study. In other words, we've seen lots of stuff, and you've heard me talk about studies where people make a conclusion that multivitamins don't help cure cancer. But the study wasn't designed for that. They just drew this conclusion later on. They said, oh, by the way, those people that we gave the multi-2 starting at age 65, you know, some of them still got cancer. Well, <laughs> that's not the time to start if you're trying to evaluate uh, the, the health benefits of a multivitamin, right? So I, I look at the focus of the study. So the, the, the trim T study we'll use as an example, okay, is, is very clearly defined. They wanted to see what that, wet, what that mango seed extract was going to do in terms of affecting body weight and metabolic parameters. So they're really clear. The second thing that I look at on a study are the authors and any affiliations. Mm -hmm. So why do I do that? Well, because you want to know, you know, like who's doing the work. Is it being done at a university? Is it being done by a government lab? Is it being done at a hospital? We, we just, it's good to know that because it gives you a frame of reference, you know. And so in this particular case, the Welltrim study was done at a university in Cameroon. And um, the, the final manuscript was reviewed by somebody at Wake Forest University. And um, one of the things is that the products were provided by what's a company called Gateway Health Alliance, and they're the company that makes Welltrim. Now, you might say, well, is that a good thing if they're actually involved in providing product? Well, I, in, this is common. I would say 95% of all studies related to food and supplements, they're going to be providing it. Because when I worked in research at USDA, we did studies regarding nutritional supplementation. But the thing is, is that nobody's going to pay for those studies, right? Because it's not like, you know, we were always competing for the same funds like cure cancer or should we, um, you know, look at a study related to health and nutrition and, you know, you know which one wins out. And it should. Um, so it's not an unusual thing and it's not a negative thing that they actually provided some samples for it. What are some red flags? Maureen's asking, like, what are some things that we, when we're looking at who's who, what the competing interest is, when would you go, mm, that's yeah, not. If, if it's a okay. author. And it's done only by the company at the company. So, um, so in this case, it was done by a university. Like at USDA, we often gave funding to universities who had great nutrition departments to be able to run independent studies. So, you know, that just means that you're that they're um, I would call them good scientific citizens, <laughs> which means that they're supporting research at a university and they're providing something that will be of interest for the individuals who are graduate students and stuff to publish. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> when we talk about that, the next thing I look at is like, what's the impact factor of the journal? And you're like, well, what is that? So <laughs> an impact factor measures um, the number of citations that get that come from a journal, and it kind of speaks to the quality of the journal. So, you know, um, a, an impact factor uh, there's for the journal that it was published in, which is lipids and health and disease, is like around 2.1. And that means that it's in the top one third of all journals, which is good, you know? So um, when a, there's a brand new journal, it doesn't mean it's bad, but it takes a while for them to get a decent impact factor, okay? okay. So uh, the next thing I look at is the type of the study. And the kind of study, you know, like how many participants were there? So if we can use the Welltrim study again, 
um, there would be 102 participants. They had 52 people in the well trim group, and then they had 50 people in the control group. So I always tell the story about when I started with OPC3 that I wanted to have an idea of how effective it was as an anti-inflammatory, right? Yeah. So I went to my doctor before I ever started with it, and I had him do a, a sed rate and a C-reactive protein. And so, you know, the, the point on that is that he was, he's a good sport, and so he did those measurements for me. And then I started with OPC, and we remeasured three weeks later. So um, my sed rate and C-reactive protein fell in half, Sarah. So that, that was fabulous. Yeah. So that was a, an experiment of N equal one, all right? There was no control, right? There was just me. And I got great results, so it was a valid experiment. But you know, the company subsequently went on and did a big um, study where they uh, actually um, had, I like, believe it was 60 participants. And in that case, um, they saw a 52% reduction for a larger population. So does that, does that make sense? Uh, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's important to take it into consideration. Like it doesn't mean that small is not good, but I think we can feel more comfortable if there's a larger number of participants because we Which all- the nurses study, right? Like how many people were in the nurses? Oh, uh, thousands, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and, and they, yeah. they use the physician study as well for a lot of nutritional things. So, you know, we if we're trying to figure something out because we all are unique, right? And we all can react differently to things. We all have, we're all our own little, you know, biochemistry experiment kind of. So when there's more people involved, we can get a better indication of how well it will work for more people. And I see that a lot of people, Sarah, are asking about where to get a copy of the study. And you know, it's fine for people to get it. But again, I want to caution people, if you're not really trained in reading a scientific study, you know, you, and you drop it on somebody's desk and say, hey, look at the science behind this, then that just invites them to ask you a lot of questions about, you know, the, the experimental design and everything. And if you're not a scientist, um, I'm not sure that, that it's an advantage. What we would normally recommend for somebody who doesn't have a scientific background, but who wants to share something more scientific, would be to actually just share the abstract. And the abstract, I'll just hold this up. I don't know if it's backwards or forwards, but the abstract is at the bottom of the page. And you can, people can always go um, to NIH. They can go to the National Library of Medicine and simply look for the abstract. Or you could print out just the first page of the whole study that you've been kind enough to provide the link for. And they'll see the yeah. abstract there. And the abstract includes, for example, the background, a summary of the methods. It includes the summary of the results. And it also lists the, the registration of the clinical trial. And I didn't mention that earlier, but you want, if there's a clinical trial, which means people are being um, given a particular, you know, um, treatment protocol to follow, you want to make sure that it's got what we call IRB approval, which means that it's all sanctioned by the medical professionals, making sure that it's safe and when the study's done. So we've made it through the focus of the study. We talked a little bit about authors and affiliates. We talked about the impact factor for the journal and where it's being published. So then the next thing I look at is what are the hypotheses? You know, like what, what, what question are they trying to answer? And going back to the trim T study, they wanted to see what effect the well trim would have on weight. And they also wanted to know what effect it would have, for example, on other metrics. So they looked at weight, they looked at waist measurements, they looked at leptin levels, they looked at fat percentage, they looked at adiponectin levels, they looked to see if LDL and, um, and total cholesterol changed. They looked at C-reactive protein, which is, I mentioned earlier with the OPC, it's a marker of inflammation. And then they also looked at glucose. So, you know, um, anyway, that's, that's all the, the parameters they looked at. And then they were very systematic in their conclusions. There's tons of, you know, graphs and tables and things for us to be able to look at. I mean, you know, again, it takes a little bit of, experience with looking at, at uh, scientific stuff to be able to read all that. But um, there's a really nice table in it that's been summarized. And um, we saw a, a summary of that also at the recent Nutrimetrics um, uh, annual convention. Um, so I think it's a really well put together study. It has 25 references. That's the other thing. So when someone's doing a scientific study, you always want to know that they've taken into consideration other information that's available in the literature um, so that you know that, they, that they're kind of up to speed, right? Because, you know, somebody could just go out and start their own experiment. Why would they not want to build on what's already been done and is already considered, you know, factual when it comes to that particular, you know, subject that you're, that you're studying? 
um, when I was a pharmaceutical rep, right. we used to have a lot of literature supporting the drugs that we sold. And I could take one study and go back to the doctor with info on that study 12, 13, 14, 15 times. Because like you said, there's all those charts and diagrams. Right. And there are so many times, you know, that, that they go back and it's, or that they're looking not just at one factor. So I would take this trim T study and, and people always ask, what do I bring Sarah for follow up? And they always want to bring something else. They're like, well, should I bring now MA web centers? Should I bring, you know, um, a different product? I'm like, no, if you led with trim T, you, you know, you can go in one time and talk about weight loss. You can go at another time and talk about C-reactive protein levels. You can go in another time and talk about the fat production that went down by 80%. You know, there's, there's a lot there that you can talk about with that one product, with the one study. You go with that and keep like, you know, driving the point home. Right, yeah. absolutely. And because many of us are calling on health professionals and perhaps leading with this, they, they would like to see a, a copy of the actual study. I just, you know, people want to be sure that they understand what they're, what they're highlighting in the study well enough to be able to answer the questions. Right. Um, somebody asked about OPC. So should we talk about that a little bit as well? Yeah, I'm trying to um, bring up because what I really like is, um, and I'll, I'll provide the link. I like that in Lisa Grant's in unlimitedlifestyles.net, she went through and she has one you can print out with the information highlighted. Right. That's important. So like you're saying, no one's going to read the whole thing. Like not, don't just be, you're going to look at it as an NC, like not you, Nancy, like the me. And I'm an NC. I'm going to be like, that's a lot of stinking words on this page. <laughs> Where do I, so I just print it off. A doctor, just because they're a doctor, like they're going to think the same thing. Like that's a lot of stinking words on one page. Like they don't really want to read all the words either. You really, so how we read this stuff though, Sarah, you want to know how I read it really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So when I get a when I get a paper, I'm first going to read the title, and then I'm going to okay. read the abstract, and then yep. I'm going to flip to the very back where the references are, and typically back there you're going to find some conclusions, and so I'm going to read at the end of the discussion they have conclusions, and when they have their conclusions, that's typically like where do we see this going? What additional research might we need to do? I'm going to read that first to see what their bottom line was before I go back and delve into how did they do it? Why did they do it? What were the results? Did they have enough you know, participants and all that kind of stuff? Does that make sense? Yeah. And your docs sense. are probably gonna do the exact same thing. So if you hand somebody a publication, don't be surprised if they scan the first page and then flip to the last page. <laughs> okay, all right, right, yeah, so I shouldn't be offended. But do you ever go through and highlight things for docs uh, I, so they know? I don't do that for another scientist because they might be offended by that because Everybody wants to, like, they, they think different things, but I think doing that for a doc is a fabulous idea. Okay, all right. Okay, that's good to know. All right. Um, what about OPC3 studies? Well, I just, we know? before we got on, Sarah, somebody posted and asked about my experience with that and, you know, why OPC was of interest to me, to the, you know, when we were working, when I was working with the government as a researcher and program leader for nutrition for the U.S. So OPCs are naturally anti-carcinogenic, anti-atherogenic, and anti-inflammatory. And, you know, I mentioned that I did my little experiment of N equal one, but the company's subsequently gone on. And we do have multiple publications, one in angiology. Um, and so we have a publication that shows the, by looking at markers related to the absorption of the OPC3, it shows the improvement in absorption as a function of using the isotonic versus using a pill or tablet. So they did that study for us. So when somebody's asking me about you know, gee, it makes sense that the isotonics would be way better. But, you know, do you have any proof? That's a wonderful thing to be able to use. And it's right in the front of the Nutrimetrics catalogs, many of the uh, issues of that. And, that, you know, if people just look at the area kind of under the curve, you can see that not only is it more rapid absorption, but it's more complete absorption. So that's a great thing, I think, for people to have, you know, going back and, again, pointing to a study, which is providing us with great info that really makes the science more usable. I think, you know, as a scientist, one of my favorite things to do is to try to translate science into something that people can use on a daily basis. 
uh, because, you know, like you said, nobody's going to read through seven pages of tiny font, you know, of, of, of stuff. So, you know, my goal is to put it in a format where people can use it more easily and where they can kind of highlight the bottom line. The second study that we have that shows the 52% reduction in C-reactive protein is in angiology. And so it's, it's really focusing on, you know, the cardiovascular markers. But there is so much literature, as you know, Sarah, out there on pycnogenol. Everything from helping women with hot flashes as they're going through menopause to um, improving circulation to reducing inflammation. I mean, so, you know, if somebody's um, leading with OPC um, as a product when they once they've gone through the discovery meeting and then they're talking about recommendations for a proposal, then I feel like we have just like a, a whole multitude of options in terms of great science to support OPC as one of the, the products you might be recommending. So now I sometimes, like a lot of people do, is I'll Google, you know, like I'll Google pycnogenol and hot flashes or whatever. And I, I find a Huffington Post article or a, you know, something that's then was published, you know, on ABC News right. or, you know, why is that? Is that an okay thing to share with my docs or not an okay thing? Right. So, you know, as you know, I did a, a talk on nutrition in the news at the recent conference in, um, in Herndon. And, you know, by the time something shows up in the popular press, if it's a legitimate thing, sometimes there can be a little bit of a delay. Because what's the press looking for? They're looking for something that's controversial, something that's going to make people sit up and take notice. So, you know, they want that headline that says multivitamins don't cure cancer or no value to a multivitamin. That's what they're looking for. But, you know, I think to have it in an easily digestible form, um, I love using the popular press for people, whether it's Huffington Post, we'll use that example. They have, they get, they, they do a decent job. But when I look at who is writing those articles, I still am going to look at to see who's doing that. Because sometimes somebody's writing it and they're a science writer. And that's, you know, they may have a little bit of training in science and statistics. Sometimes they're writing it and then they turn around and write an article on makeup, you know, and I, I, it, that doesn't mean that they don't have a background in science, but if they don't share that as part of their credentials, then, uh, you know, I kind of just take it a little bit with a grain of salt. So I think that the popular press stuff, you know, can be helpful because it's, it's already digested and I'm most comfortable with it when it's done and they actually refer to the original study. So using the Weltrim study as an example, if it was in the popular press and it said, you know, a recent study on uh, Welltrim uh, published in lipids and health, lipids in health and disease, that would make me feel more comfortable because that would mean that they weren't just taking it from another abstract, from another something else that somebody else wrote. It's kind of like that game we played when we were kids. If you were, I don't know if you were Girl Scout, but I was. And so, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we used to do was whisper in somebody's ear and then they'd whisper in the next person's and it would go around the circle, right? Well, sometimes what we find with scientific studies is by the time it goes around the circle, it comes out the other end not sounding anything like the original. So, yeah, I think that I, I think there's a, a, a lot of value in having it in an easy to understand format, but a little caution's warranted in trying to make sure that they're not going for a sensational headline or that they just don't know what they're talking about. Dee and I sometimes text things back and forth to each other like, did you see this? Like, this is insane. <laughs> and it, it's, it's sometimes it's, um, it's so old, um, the data too. So yeah, there's a lot of things that they're, that are just misconceptions, you know, without getting into some controversial topics, but right. uh, as a mom, you know, I'm in a lot of mom's groups and we're always questioning things and, um, you know, with my background, you know, I, I, I know a little more than I'm letting on here in this interview, you know, cause I'm trying to say when I was new, what were my questions, but, um, but I, I'm like, I read that study and that's not a good study. It's exactly. hard to bash the, the moms and the lay person and be like, you know, I, I read that and that had conflicting info and it just kept, you know, snowballing and it still snowballs. And you're like, oh, guys, come on. Like you just keep beating a dead horse there. So just to get headlines. Well, um, you know, my they, question though, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say ahead. an interesting point about, you know, how old a study is. And the one thing I would like to say is that we, we have, there are studies that we consider to be like seminal studies, something that's just, it's, it, it's um, really the foundation of further research. And so you'll oftentimes, when you're looking through the references of a recent study, you might see a reference that's a good bit older. 
And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just want people to understand, you can't just look at a list of references and go, oh my gosh, that's from 1992. Well, it might be that it's like, like it's a foundational article. And see, that's, I think, another piece of this. You know, if you're an expert in a field and you read a study, that's very different. Like if I were to go over, I'm sure there's wonderful studies on skincare products and stuff. And even though I'm a scientist, I might not understand those nearly so well as the nutrition related articles or a medical article where I have that specific training. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's good too for people to remember that doctors are the same way and they don't have necessarily even that nutrition background. Oh. And so it, it is for us. And that's what I want this forum to be because we have a lot of experts on here and we've had people that have taken time with the studies. You know, I'd rather have everyone on this call understand really well right. two to three studies. Right. That's what I did as a pharma rep. I didn't know all the science behind my drug. I knew two to three key studies that I could recite inside and out and I memorized the bullet points on. Um, you know, I'm going around and I, it didn't take me that long to memorize four or five bullet points on the Welchrim study. Exactly. And now I talk about it. So, um, so just know that and know that if you have the study to back it up and you do know the bullet points, like, again, that's what doctors want to know. Right. Like they might scan it if they want you to prove it. But, you know, I think everyone thinks that every doctor is going to be that um, analytical personality. Oh, no. And they're not all like that. <laughs> well, it was really funny because early on um, in my career working with Nutrametrics, um, my senior partner is Arlene Lowy. And so she came with me to call on a doctor. And in fact, it was my personal doctor. And um, it was a really interesting uh, conversation. And I was, I'm like, oh, I've got Arlene there. This is going to be a slam dunk. And she knows everything about sponsoring doctors and everything. And, you know, you don't know, as, as you know, we never know when we go into an appointment what's going to be most important, right? So we got there and Arlene started and she was talking about Nutrimetrics and the huge potential and income and, you know, revenue, revenue generating wellness programs and all that. And the doctor said, t turned to me and said, well, but I want to know the details on, on some, you know, you're recommending this OPC. Can you talk to me about the details of the science? And she kind of just went, and take it away, Nance, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> um, you're right that you can't predict, but I don't think that that's generally going to be the number one thing that somebody's looking for. With the kind of things, um, Sarah, I have this, and I'm happy to post this if people would like to see it, yeah. but it's basically a summary of the Welltrim study with the key bullet points so that it's, you have that as a starting point to learn it to understand what are some key aspects of it. And then we can, from there, then if necessary, provide the full publication as sort of backup. I know that's been circulating. Where did that come from originally? Did it come from the vendor? The, no, um, I, I put it did together. It, did study. I, so the original thing, the thing here, this picture on the, on the side here with the book, yeah, that yeah. was provided by Dr. Mark Lang. He presented that when we were in Greensboro, and then he also uh, provided it uh, at Product Symposium. I added the bullet points on the side that added in the data regarding fasting blood glucose, adiponectin levels, C-reactive protein, cholesterol, et cetera. So, you know, um, I think that, uh, you know, that graph by itself is really phenomenal, but that's not actually in the, if you were to look at the scientific publication, it's not in there. Okay. So, um, and I'm not sure if Mark got it from literature from the vendor or not. I'm not really certain where it actually. Because that's what I do sometimes with yep. our trademarked ingredients. So if I'm going in to talk about probiotics, like I right now have a chiropractor in the funnel. Right. I will put into the Google live back and I will go find, it's not that hard. No, it's not. And the vendor oftentimes has a marketing pamphlet or a marketing PowerPoint. Yep. And I'll just take a screenshot, a slide or whatever. I'm not even that fancy man as you are, Nancy. I, I don't even print it. I like literally be like, here's my iPhone. Like, <laughs> this is what I found on the internet. It's a screenshot. It'll have like my battery percent at the top, you well, know, and it's like, this is, here you go. Like I'll text it to you if you want me to text it to right. you. Yeah. The reason it got printed, uh, Sarah, was because we did a TLS table for our district on Saturday. Okay. And you saw, if you noticed, there was a little thing of trim tea at the bottom, a little empty one, definitely not a full one with a high demand for it. <laughs> Yeah, no one wants them until until they walk away. That's what I always say to my doctors. Yeah, you don't think it's going to sell until someone takes it. So, I, again, I'm just trying to make this really simple for everyone, that the tools are out there. And that, again, is what this group is for, right. you know, is to say. But but it's not going to be for you to tag Dr. Nancy now to, 
and just say, Dr. Nancy, what is a study on right. HGH secretagogue? No, no, no. It's do a little bit of homework. If you want to post something and say, you know, am I reading this right? Is this, you know, a, it, to me, it looks like it's a, a meta-analysis. Like, is that what it looks like to you? Or to me, it looks like this is a double-blind placebo study. Is that what it looks like to you? Am I right? You know, we can definitely do some of that. And I don't know, maybe we can take like the next week, Dr. Nancy, if you don't mind, and we can do, you know, uh, this versus this study, you know, and sure. which would you choose? We could do that. You know, we can make it. Like, or we could go through uh, something else related to another one of our products. Um, if you had another ingredient that you were, that was hot, that you thought people would, you know, that are using a lot in their proposals for working with health professionals, we could do that. So whatever you would like, mm -hmm. let me know. And yeah, just reading in different ways. So, I mean, I think that that's going to be great. I know already in the links, you guys have two links. You have one to the trim tea study. I've already linked below to OPC three abstracts right. and an OPC three study that's already highlighted there you for go. you to be able to give your health professionals. So, so you know, if we, if you just had those two things alone, guys, you can build an empire on this. Like you, you know, can build an empire. Yeah, people are jumping pin levels yesterday in a single day, just as a result of Trim Tea. In your group? Or did that? Yes, Val Myers. No way. <laughs> yeah. No way. I didn't even know. I know. Val, I'm like getting I goosebumps. Saw on our trainers page, but you know you. Heard oh my god. <laughs> I can't wait. I got to congratulate her. So exciting. I know. So well deserved too. Yeah. yeah. Very well deserved. That's, that's awesome. You know, and that's what it takes guys. It just takes a little bit of focus, effort and consistency. And you know, and the people that you're seeing do it, they work their butts off. Oh, for they sure. absolutely work their butts off. Like you're doing Dr. Nancy. I mean, you're calling me every other day. <laughs> got a meeting here, a meeting there, this, this and that. And I mean, you've got more problems because you're generating more activity. And that's the thing I just want to tell people when you're generating activity, you're creating problems. Oh, for sure. It gets what always happens. And so just learn how to eat problems for breakfast, get over it, keep going with you. I'm mean, not talking to you, Dr. Nancy, I'm just talking to everyone else. Right. But I mean, that's what, yeah, you're going to generate more issues when you generate success. And you just got to figure out how to figure it out. And right. then and then you'll see, you know, the income will follow. But it's got to, I've been listening in my in my group this week, one of my accountability groups, we um, were listening to JR's original basic five. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. And uh, he says in it, you know, what do you think? Like, you think if you are JR or you're Dennis Franks, like, of course you'd be successful, right? Just like you thought with Arlene Lowy, like, right. you know, you put Arlene Lowy in front of anyone and of course she's going to be successful. Right. But Arlene Lowy, JR, Dennis Franks, they were successful yourself, Dr. Nancy, you guys are successful before you even go out because you're successful here. Right. And that's what it means. You got to start by saying, I'm a success. I'm doing this. I'm a director. I'm going to make it here. And you got to power pose and you got to, you know, just go out there. And guys, it's not that the confidence will come. It's that the confidence starts here. And we're trying to give you some tools like understanding studies just so you have the words, right? So you got to, I mean, I don't care. Prop up your, your baby, your stuffed animals, your cat, your neighbor, whatever it is. <laughs> just say, do you mind if I just practice getting the words out about this trim tea study? Because um, the first time you might not know how to say um, a adepinectin. Is that how I even say it? Is that the right word? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. You just got to say it a couple times, and then it'll roll off your tongue. I mean, pycnogenol. Like these are all new words. So um, you know, you got to say them a couple times, and that's part of the success up here. But you know, Sarah, we also need to thank the Nutrimetrics team. I really appreciate everything that you do to support the field, and you know, we have an amazing team of people. Uh, whether it's the gals in the office or whether it's you in the field or Dr. D and Brandy. I mean, everybody's amazing. And we all can be better as a result of collaborating the way we're doing this. So I thank you very much. I, I love all your posts on Facebook. And I, I think doing these live um, interviews is really very va uh, valuable to the field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you guys want any other topics or experts or things, but I think what we're going to do, a lot of great things came out of the annual convention. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, this was just fresh of mind for you. So, you know, what else can I take? What other um, segments can we redo, basically? So, I mean, we can't hear it enough, basically, the same things. We just need to hear this again and again and again. Right. So I hope everyone 
who watches this and tags your team below, gives us a thumbs up, give us some feedback so we know um, what was helpful about this interview and what you still have questions on. And uh, Dr. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. had a great day. It's always fun to visit with you. Yes. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.